feel like I'm still on a bit of a high from being with the students. The last session I did was mo mostly students, but some folks from the community, and then I was so fortunate to have a uh, lunch with some of the students and uh, just really talk more and listen to their thoughts and where they, what moves them and how their own spiritual path influences how they treat the earth and how they treat others. And just watching and feeling the core of them come to life in our brief conversation and engagement, I feel so envious of uh, the professors here and the uh, administrators to know what a great student body you have. And having engaged now with Alan a bit and see his work, I'm very impressed with this, uh, putting it right out. We're talking about ethics and morality and how we make decisions. And the, uh, I had dinner last night with President Hirsch, and it was a wonderful time together with some of the other speakers. And the morning presenters both, I felt like I had to, they almost did my whole presentation for me. <laughs> And I'm really thankful to the work they've done and the inspiration that they gave in the information because it's so important that we begin to really talk and open up around how are we going to grapple with really making a livable planet. And my topic is kind of, it can be, you know, so what do you mean degrowth? We, you know, economic growth is all you hear on the news. Every day when you listen to, no matter what radio station you listen to, unless you maybe get very alternative media, you're going to hear the stock market. So when they're growing up, when, they're, when the points are up, you're supposed to be happy. When they're down, you're supposed to be pretty sad. And if you study economics in probably any campus, you're, basically what you're going to learn is that we can't grow. We, we die without growth. And I'm going to try to present another opinion that with growth, we die. The kind of exponential growth we've been doing is the most dangerous thing we could do right now on planet Earth. And I have my own 26 year now experiment in degrowth. Back in 1989, I also saw the Exxon Valley spill. I was in a five star hotel in Stockholm, Sweden, the Royal Viking. I had flown first class. I was meeting with arms dealers throughout Europe selling top secret equipment. I was the lead engineer for designing, and then they sent me over to meet with arms dealers to sell it. And when I watched the Valley's spill come on at the bar, I started to cry. And I looked across this big oak bar into the mirror, and I looked at my own image, and I said, the captain, yeah, he was maybe drinking too much and ran aground, but I'm drunk on fossil fuel. I drive three miles to work every day. I've flown seven intercontinental flights in one year. I'm like, the jury of Wales was saying, Jim, you're guilty, bro. <laughs> I couldn't have escaped it. And I knew when I went home I had to change and I didn't know what to do. But I parked my car firmly and I started biking to work every day. And then I started writing big checks to environmental groups. And that didn't feel good enough. And I was putting like the $200 checks instead of the $40 checks out. And then in six months I was having an emergency, a spiritual emergency an ethical hemorrhage, and I couldn't live with myself, being part of destroying the planet. And I locked myself into my home, and I said, i got to figure it out. And I got out my engineering economics textbooks, and I asked the question, what do I need, instead of how much can I get? And I ran numbers back and forth. I said, well, what if I take the car off the road? What if I rent out three out of the four bedrooms in my house? What if I plant a vegetable garden? I put all the numbers in and ran the numbers and I said, wow, at 30 years old, I have enough assets to retire the rest of my life without working and if I live on $5,000 a year. Just so happened at the time that was the global average GDP per person. And I picked up my electric base and started playing a little line and I just thought to myself, you know, I could do this. I went in Monday, gave my notice and that was 26 years ago. And I still haven't touched the capital, I haven't eroded the capital that I started with. And I've been more or less living on roughly 5000 a year. And so I went from like 45000 to 5000 overnight. That was my degrowth experiment. And I'm so lucky to tell, I don't look too shabby, do I? <laughs> These are all thrift store clothes, by the way. <laughs> but I, I began a new way of life. And students asked me, well, what did you do first? What were your first steps? And I said, I had 13 yard sales. 
People said, is this like a multi-family yard sale? I'm like, no, this is Jim. This is his antique car, his speedboat, his motorcycle, all his toys. They were all up for sale. And when I got done with 13 yard sales, I was down to one bedroom and I rented three of the four bedrooms out. And I became a full-time environmental activist. And the newspaper in my town, they had a, a muckraker and he called me a professional thorn in the side. Because I was going to like city council meeting after city council meeting, I got appointed to the director, I served several terms as Sierra Club chair, elected official boards of different environmental groups. And I started working seven or eight hours a week for free, but I had a great time and I learned a lot. And um, it's a journey that for me was very powerful and fun. And uh, I want to share some about what it took to do this journey for me to degrowth and sustainability. And the real crux of it, in a certain sense, is I'm going to change something on my screen here. There we go. Is how do we reestablish a balance with nature, with all life on Earth? And we know, we all know the past and the history and the data. We, we know it real well, the growth trends. And what degrowth is really looking at is how do we scale, downscale all this in a way that enhances people's well-being, is more equitable. And people will say, well, maybe in the beginning we need to do civil disobedience, voluntary simplicity, be a researcher in a university, do anything that you know how to do that you love doing that's going to help the planet. So in the beginning we're doing all these things that are creative interventions into a culture that's stuck on growth. Any job we have, we can be involved in helping degrow. And at one point, we're spreading the word and we start to get the degrowth taking place. And it really happens. The redistribution happens. The culture changes. The inner feeling changes. That's what Mary was really helping us with in the first session. How the inside of us has got to change. Our spirit, our, it's probably already there. You just gotta peel up a few layers of the onion and you get down to that beautiful core it's in every person, you can't erase it, that cares. People say, oh, people don't care. I'm like, I don't know anyone that doesn't care. I've never met a human being that doesn't care. So it just happens to be the circles I'm in. Like, my dad was like right of Rush Limbaugh. And he was, two in, he was a truck driver with nine kids. And when we passed somebody on a, and he was broken down the side of the road, my dad would stop and help. You know, that's just, the way he was. If someone's hitchhiking on the road, he picks him up. Picks up a kid who was beating up my younger brother. And my dad was a bulldog, so he grabbed him by the neck and just said, look, you touch my son again, you're going to have a few broken parts of your body. But he gave him a ride home, dropped him off at his house, and next time he'll pick him up again. But he was a force of, to be reckoned with, but some part of him felt he cared. I could see how he cared. And it's infectious. But when we get, once we do this downshift, we can go out into the future and we, and with uh, a sustainable future forever. And we have to get to that point. The trends are not pretty. The most dangerous thing we can do is not act. And when we see the capacity that people have to transform, it's beautiful. But you could go to a workshop or go to this lecture and hear some good things and go home to your same life and keep living it. And it may be a very sustainable life, and it may be a very unsustainable life. Some will transform and some won't. We have the capacity to be beautiful or brutal. And it's just, that's the human condition. I don't understand it fully. But I think we have everything we need to be beautiful. And we have everything we need to, to shift. All the information, all the caring, it's all there. And this is where we are in history. You know, if all the world's people live like Americans, we need five Earths. No generation can say they've watched the destruction of planetary systems. You know, here we are. Endless growth is the ideology of a cancer cell. We're stuck in it. As an engineer, the most inspiring and encouraging thing is the three factors that primarily drive my consumption is my impact is basically equal to my affluence, how many children I have, and how efficient my technology is. What's so cool is all three I have full control over. For instance, no one can make me earn more money. 
The advertisers can't make me buy their stuff. I can watch all their advertising say that I'll get the prettiest girl, or if I'm a woman, I'll be the most empowered woman if I drive the, the, this SUV through the creeks, you know, and drive up onto a mountaintop. If that doesn't work on you, if their, their tactics don't work on you, then you can fully 100% control how much you consume, how many children I have. Like, I could have 20 women dancing around me all wanting to procreate at the same time. I'm talking hypothetical, this never happened. But, <laughs> I'm in 100% control of my fertility. Okay, how efficiently we employ, no one can force me to drive a gas guzzler or not insulate my house or turn a thermostat, leave a thermostat up when I go to work. Right now, humans can spend the entire Earth by October, by August 29. So we're 150% overshooting what the planet can, uh, can tolerate. If you take away the deep oceans, deserts, ice caps, and build up land, we're left with about uh, 30 billion bioproductive acres. You divide it by 7 billion people. We each get about four and a quarter acres, and guys, you don't get a mermaid. But this excludes the needs of the other 25 million species. This is in humans eating the entire ecological enchilada. And if you say, well, how much of the Earth do we need to leave wild if we're going to have species extinction rates not accelerated due to human presence? Conservation biologists say 80%. So we have to learn to live on one acre. So you have to take the four and a quarter down to one. That's 80% of the four and a quarter. So you see humans are using 6.5. There only exists 4.25. That's a 50% overshoot. An American at 20 acres is, needs five Earths, and that's not sharing with the other, Earth, other species. So to share the Earth with other species, we need a factor of 20 reduction currently if we don't address population. Here's the data. It's done every year by a global footprint network. 28 researchers out in Oakland, California. It's published in the most prestigious scientific journals. The Stockholm Institute, which was mentioned this morning, looks at nine planetary boundaries that we must respect if we want to have a livable planet. The green is a safe operating zone. Currently, biodiversity loss, climate, uh, and nitrogen loading, that's basically agribusiness. Um, running off into our rivers and, and creating havoc. Acidification is high, land use. All these factors are getting beyond what's safe. If we look at the disparity, the inequity, a child, if you talk to a child, you say, one for you, one for me. They're fine. You say, one for you, two for me. Yeah. Most kids will let you get away with it. One for you, three for me. Kids say, wait a minute, that's not fair. Three-year-old knows fairness. How can an, an adult allow it to get to 250 to 1? Poorest billion to the richest billion. It's unbelievable what we as, a, as an adult can allow happen to us. That we can be okay, like go to work and, and just flip on with our life and let this continue on, this kind of radical disparity. And I had this emergency happen and I... You know, I heard Dick Cheney build the case. I was with like 5,000 offense contractors in Mons selling my top secret device that I was a lead engineer with 25 engineers working for me, a top secret crypto uh, box in the 80s, like a Blackberry, but it could work underwater by a skin diver and had to transmit top secret information. And I'm selling it at this trade show in, in Europe with 5,000 other arms dealers there. And, Women with like bikinis selling machine guns. This is what's there. I, I, you'd have to go see it to believe it. And Dick Cheney's the keynote speaker saying, Don't worry, low intensity conflict. We're going to always have wars for you to make the weapons for. So there was no weapons of mass destruction. All Powell's allegations were completely lies. If you listen to alternative media like Democracy Now!, she would debunk this stuff real time. You have to listen to Democracy Now! and other things. Listen to your NPR, but you're going to get mostly bad information off I found after listening to this for 20 years. See, go backtrack and see who was telling the truth 20 years down the road. Who told you what was really happening at the time? There was no nuclear program. They found Saddam Hussein in a hole in the earth by himself. I thought he'd be in a high-tech bunker with 200,000 people. We made absolute mess, killed 2 million other people, and we got away with it. We're attacking 
Okay, this was the shock and awe. You take their city down. By this I mean you get rid of their power, water, in one, two, three, four, five days. They're physically, emotionally, and psychologically exhausted. Impose this overwhelming level of shock and awe against an adversary to paralyze it, its will to carry on, to so overload an adversary's per perceptions and understanding of events that the enemy would be incapable of resistance. This is how we define it. We put it on the newspapers, shock and awe. It was like draining the swamps, is what we said to Vietnam. We killed three million of their people with napalm and bombing raids that were in completely un... You look at the old footage, you can't even believe it. Like, they were peasant farmers. Peasant farmers getting blown to smithereens. And this is happening under my watch. And it's an ethical crisis that hit me so deep that I can't stop working on it. You know, I can't have the luxury of being depressed or, or like, confused. I don't have the luxury anymore. You know, when I say, when you send a drone in, you know, how long did they take to find out if O.J. Simpson was guilty or not? Like how many years? With trials and juries and investigators, a drone, how much time do you have to decide? Is this person guilty of anything? This is, it's a person in a, in a bunker in Nevada looking at a computer screen killing people. And we do this in 14 Islamic countries. These are the countries that we've been militarily engaged in, in in the Middle East. And when I see it, I know I'm not naive as to the power of U.S. military. We're the number one arms dealer on the planet Earth. We are the one world superpower right now. We have, we're involved around the world in regime change. So we arm factions that are favorable to U.S. business interests. That's what I was doing in the 80s. That's who I met with. And they're, we're arming people to destabilize the government in favor of whatever faction of the government there is more favorable to U.S. business interests. And this is the founder of liberation theology. You know, poverty is not a fate, it's a condition. It's not a misfortune, it's an injustice. You know, when we did the TARP, Trouble Asset Relief Program, $1 billion was decided about a week to give to these bankers. We could have Double the poorest billions income for seven years with that one seven one decision. And then trillions spent on war and bailouts. Lester Brown, one of the most respected planet researchers, he says only 190 billion, that's only 20% of our current US's world uh, military budget, would end world poverty, guarantee universal health care, stabilize population growth, and curtail global warming. When people say we can't afford this, they're lying to you. You know, when should we have eradicated poverty was yesterday. And now, welcome to the Anthropocene. And when I was at Dartmouth, I'd ride my bike to campus and pass this line of cars going to campus. Everything I just told you, they know. Very smart at Dartmouth College. But there's still one person per car going to work every day. So I was in India, and I was, they were asking me why you're in India. I so said, I came to India to learn from the people here. So I lived in villages and I learned about their, their movements to, towards sustainability in Kerala, India, where people have high quality of life with a GDP of 350 bucks a year, low infant mortality, and healthy people. And it's like, wow, how did you do it? And, oh, well, what are you doing here? I came to learn from you. And, they, and I say, well, we're addicted to our cars. And they kept telling me there was this one Swami I had to see. His name was Swami, you don't need a car. <laughs> to help us with our mantras, you know, oh, I need my car. But are you ready for degrowth? You know, all the facts are adding up. We heard other speakers, I don't want to be labor. But how do you do it with no losers? And I think it's very easy to do it with no losers. So first, those with too much curtail, like Mother Teresa said, oh, what well, she came in here and saw is a poverty of spirit. You know, when you're a consumer, culture, there's a poverty of spirit. Then those without enough are helped out of poverty. And what they find is any society that's eradicated poverty, the, the women have smaller families, they become educated, and they aren't just a baby-making machine for colonialization anymore. And they volunteer, they don't want to have a lot of family, uh, children. They're happy with one or two children. So Kerala went from five or six child families down to 1.5 child families over a 40-year period through education. They didn't have to force it on them like China. They did it. 
Okay, so that's like a self-reinforcing positive way. If we eradicate poverty around the world, we can deal with the population issue. Net degrowth of footprint and population still has to happen. So some have to degrow and some have to grow. And then, but to do it, we can create full employment. So we have to work less. Some of us volunteer to take less time, work less. If they don't mandate it, we can do it. Take time for our kids, for our family, our community to volunteer. A thousand points of light, George Bush said it, but he didn't mean it. But that's what he meant by a thousand points of light, is we go out and help wherever we can do it. And then consume less, work less. It all fits together. And then shift toward green and clean. I'm not against business. I'm, you know, we got to grow the businesses that are doing the restoration and get rid of the ones that are hurting. So divest from fossil fuel, get off of it as quick as we can, as, as lovingly as we can, as soon as we can. And like one decision, you can just move where you don't need to be in the car all the time. You know, it may not, you can't do it tomorrow, but people move on every, average every four or five years. So once you have the earth as a major motivator, you can make these life decisions over time. And, you know, I was in Cuba where they have free education, health care, and dental. Why don't we? <laughs> they do it. And they, you know, so, and the sacred economy, the do it yourself, the volunteer. I mean, I was crying when I was hanging out with these students from India because I remember being there. And they would say, oh, our guests are our gods. And you'd feel this, it was more than a saying. You know, a 10,000 year old tradition, when you see a stranger in your village, you invite them to have tea with you. So a young man would see me and invite me to have tea, and I'd come to his home after that. He'd say, come, meet my family. And so I'd hang out with him. He took me on a scooter all over the city, showed me all the sights. I met him on a bus, you know. At the end of the day, I saw his father looked a little annoyed, and I kind of said, well, what's going on with your father? He said, oh, I'm supposed to go to work today. <laughs> and you could really feel it. Well, the degrowth is happening, and Europe had a conference, 3,000 people from 74 countries talking about it, and this encyclical that's on its way that we're waiting for, but he said a lot of beautiful stuff already, Pope Francis, and yeah, like, for the most part, it is man who continuously slaps down nature. And if you look online, you can find lots of good stuff that he is actually sharing. Some people continue to defend trickle-down theories, which assume that economic growth encouraged by a free market will inevitably succeed and bring about greater justice and inclusiveness in the world. This opinion, which has never been confirmed by the facts, expresses a crude and naive trust in the goodness of those wielding economic power and in the sacralized workings of the prevailing economic system. Meanwhile, the excluded are still waiting. Sounds like liberation theology to me. And, you know, he has a history, and when you know, he was under the Pinochet government, and he couldn't say this then, and he didn't. And I know he's probably going through his own journey in, in understanding that for himself, and I think he's making up for it now. And. He's calling on the world to redistribute wealth, and he's here at the UN. You know, this is what the uh, right right now is calling Marxism and socialism, and these are the people that we, we, I thought we were supposed to kill them. You know, like when I was a kid, I had to climb under the desk like once a week for an air defense drill. That was because the commies were going to get us. I was brainwashed against communism. The first time I saw a booth in the town where I lived in, in California as an arms dealer, big farmer's market every week. They had a socialist booth. I said under my breath, what are those commies doing in my town? And then, four years after my transformation, I went and met the woman who was doing that booth. She'd ride her bike down with a little bike trailer and set up her booth and talk about socialism. In America, you, you could get dragged through courts to be a socialist, a communist. I'm not saying I support communism. I'm just saying, what's going on here? Why are we, why are we supposed to kill people? I didn't never met a communist until I went to India. Kerala is like full of communists all over the place. Like, and I'm eating meals with communists. This was like, what is going on? Jim is having a meal with a communist. But what's wrong with me? You know, this is the propaganda machine of America that I was indoctrinated into. Here's Naomi Klein's book. I'm in the middle of it. But you know, we've been told the market will save us when in fact, the addiction to profit and growth is digging us deeper every day. We've been told it's impossible to break free of fossil fuels, yet in fact we know exactly how to do it. 
and requires breaking every rule the free market uh, in the playbook, reigning corporate power, rebuilding local economies, and reclaiming our democracy. See, I've been involved in that stuff on the ground, like for 25 years. This is what she's talking about. That's what I've been doing in my villages and communities where I live. And all of this stuff is possible. When I was in higher ed, if you added up all the things campuses across the country are doing, we know how to do all of this stuff. We know how to be net zero, build a building with zero energy. I'm an engineer, but I, you know, I know it's possible to do this stuff. Naomi's talking about the three pillars of neoliberal age, privatization of the public sphere, you know, private prisons, private militia, Blackwater, you know, they'll go over and do the dirty work for us. Hire anyone, poverty draft, get them over there, the poor, the disenfranchised, fighting the wars, and um, deregulate. The corporate sector will do the right thing if they're deregulated, and then lower taxes, and it usually means tax relief is usually relieving the tax on the wealthier and taking away programs that help people who are poor. Martin Luther King, he says that giant triplets of racism, extreme materialism, and militarism, the 67th speech on Vietnam, it's a must to listen to, you know, over and over and over again. You can't listen to it too many times. I listen to it once a year just to help me. And uh, we know this stuff. Our society knows it. We know it inside with, with the work we have to do. And, you know, some the, the fear monitoring is grow or die. Efficiency will get us there. And the fact is that we can really do it. We have the technology and the social systems to do it. And, you know, we know the world's people can't live an American lifestyle. So we can't export that. We have to balance, reduce here, raise up there, eradicate poverty. It's not, I'm not talking socialism, I'm not talking everybody living in a Soviet apartment. That's what my dad told me. What do you want to live in, a Soviet apartment block? That was the fear mongering of certain people who enforced, formed his decisions. That's not what I'm talking about, I'm sorry. He's way smarter and more savvy and we know how to do it. And won't there be suffering with degrowth? And I say absolutely not, there should be no loser. Nothing we should do should produce a loser. But what we're doing right now is producing a billion or more losers. Hunger to the point of mental retardation and stunting of growth. That's a billion on the planet right now. People are planning for days with no food. Their family has to plan around the world to have a day with no food several times a month. No food. This is not spirituality fasting, which I am familiar with. I have to fast for five or six days to purify myself. I'm talking no food. Your whole family. And this is a reality that is completely preventable. So, and you know, isn't it God's will that we be fruitful and multiply? There was a time for that. It's not the time, it's not now. Family planning tools are available. When they're used, they work. When women are educated and women have the freedom to choose their own fertility, women are brilliant and they know how to do it all. They don't need the men to interfere and, and try to run their life. Thank you. They can control their own body, they know how to do it. They've been doing it for millennia. We had a midwife help us with our birth and it was just so amazing to see the power of a person there with a 3% cesarean rate when our net when our of our midwives in their town had a 50% cesarean rate at the hospital. How do you go 50 and 3%? Because a surgeon is taught to cut. The midwife is taught to talk with you and encourage you as a woman when you're birthing. I was there for every single contraction <laughs> and watched these midwives work like miracle workers. 80 hours of labor, my partner. <laughs> She's a powerful woman. So these are the doublings. You know, my grandpa in 1902, 1.6 billion. My father, 2 billion. Me, when I was born, 2.9. When my son, Walden, was born, 7 billion. These are the 32 year, 15, 13, 12, 12. To add another billion. This I write about in my book, Radical Simplicity. I call it the 100 year plan to sustainability. It's so simple. If we were to have two child families out till 2100, we'll grow to 9 billion because we have a lot still in the younger age group who will have children, then it would stabilize at 9 billion. But then the one acre goal would have to go to a 0.7 acre goal. That's like half of what Afghanistan, which is the poorest nation on Earth right now, has. Live as half an Afghani. 
on average, if we're to have a sustainable future with two child family in the future? 2100. If you have one child family for the next 100 years, exponential growth in, return, in reverse, you go down to 1 billion people, now each of us could have a six acre ecological footprint, which happens to be the current average. So you don't even have to reduce the average. You just distribute it better. Make the big sacrifice of being single child families for the next 100 years. We're there. Then we have 80% of the biosphere wild in 2100. There's no loser. Deep ecology, it's right there. All we have to do is small families for the next 100 years. If you want to, adopt one, have one. If you want none, have none. If your mother says, why, when are you gonna have kids? Say, I'm not mom, I'm fine without having kids, okay? If you really want to, have one. Or wait later, I had it my first child of 52. So all Walden's cousins are 30 and having kids. So we skipped a whole generation. And it's great being a dad in your 50s because like all the things that he does, I have to heart, like, wipe my smirk off because he's misbehaving, but I'm just like laughing. I'm not angry, like I don't have the anger bone I would have had at 25 or 30, and I'm not racing off to work, I'm not trying to prove myself. I've already I had like five careers. You know, I'm very happy to just hang out with him, you know, and play. You know, and me and my partner are not working. We chose not to work for the last five years. We're just doing volunteer work and being with him and living simple. And it's a wonderful life to have together. And you look at where on the planet have our small children be small families. One child families in most of Asia, Eastern Europe, Europe, and uh, Canada. Uh, so a huge, two billion of the world's people are starting to have small families. Women in Europe, they are smart, savvy. They don't want to have a lot of kids. One, 1 1.5 child families average there. And you went to Pope St. Louis birth control, the old Pope. Why is Italy and, and, and Spain, where they're very Catholic, only having 1.2, 1.3 child families? They, you know, they're educated. They don't need to just make babies. They can do it, sure. So the blue is the small families. The red is the large families. And you can see what's happening. It's poverty. Eradicate the poverty and we're there. It's just what we've got to do. It's a very simple solution. And then I've been studying the people who've been very successful to learn from them. So I've been to Carolina, India. I've been to Cuba. I've been to Spain. I haven't been to Afghanistan. But here I put it up here to show you the difference. So here you have... And the, uh, the green is the impact per person, GDP and foot, ecological footprint. This band is the fertility, the, that's how many child families. So Afghanistan has six and a half child families. Why is Kerala 1.4? Because they've eradicated poverty. Why is Afghanistan? Because we've drained the swamp of Afghanistan. We've blown them to smithereens. And now six and a half child family, average life expectancy in Afghanistan, 44 years. Carol is 75, Cuba 78, you live longer than Americans, Cuba, free education, health care, dentistry, second in the world in literacy, this is not Jim, socialist Jim's data, this is the UNICEF data, second, U.S. is 35th in education, Cuba, you know, have, they have nothing there to buy, you go to the store in Cuba, there's nothing there, I have more shoes in my house than they have in a shoe store, they've been embargoed for 50 years, they've been living under the most duress you can imagine, because they're socialists and we think they should be killed. They have far, we have the highest prison population in the world. We say it's because of human rights. Cuba has not tortured a single person. And you read, you read Castro's autobiography and he's just like, no, we don't, we, even when we did the revolution, if we captured people, we would not torture them. And that's how they won the hearts of the country, by not torturing. So you can see that, so here I'll show you some images of Kerala. And my time there studying, I lived with the family. I was there in an Earthwatch program, researchers studying why they could have such high quality of life with so few resources. And you see the status of women. So there's 104 women to 100 boys in Kerala. That's the natu natural ratio. All over the world, you have 90 girls to 100 boys. That's called fatal daughter syndrome, systematic deprivation of resources to girls in a dog eat dog post-colonial, patriarchal system. All these societies were matriarchal until the patriarchs took over. Kerala still has a powerful matriarch. Small families and norms. The guys I hung out with, they would put my, their arm around me and walk me through town. Like these kids were not like playing with bulldozers. Like my boy wants to play with the machine. He's in the ether of America. Everybody thinks, oh, it's just boys. Go to Kerala and you see it isn't just boys. Boys over there are not being hurting each other. They're not fighting violently. 
the culture does not support it. The men would put their arm around me, 22 year old man, and walk me through the village. I was nervous that maybe he was homosexual, or, and I'm not that way. And it, never, it wasn't. I had to talk to people offline. We just, it's like the men's movement could learn so much from Carolyn. It was a great place to be, playful people, abundant food. I asked these boys why they thought they were so different than all the rest of the Indians. They said, we have the cooperative mind. 60% of education, of uh, government spending is on health care education. This is an open prison. I uh, had an interpreter there the entire day, uh, 280 murderers. And the, I asked the guard, what is the philosophy of the treatment of the prisoners? And he said, well, we better treat them nice, they're all murderers. <laughs> And in 30 years, they had one escapee, one repeat offender. And it was my first time hanging out with murderers. These are tribal brothers in Kerala in the jungle, and I lived with them for, I went in three times to hang out with a Chendri, orphan. Dad's an Ayurvedic doctor when he was alive. He studied all the wild edible plants, which I also happen to, it's my, one of my passions is wild edible and medicinal plants. So, he just listed, Jedry would list off, like at night we'd sit in his, with a candle lit, and he would tell me the names of dozens and dozens of forest tubers and fruits and medicinal plants. He knew the forest inside out. So when I came home, my job from that experience was to bring this information of how we could transform to sustainability back to North America. And I'm still doing that work, but a few years back I was uh, invited to speak in Mexico for a week-long conference in uh, Veracruz, and I decided to be a real renegade and go illegally through Cancun over to Cuba. So if any of you rat on me, I'll get a $250,000 fine <laughs> from my government. You don't even have to say no, no, and stamp it, and, uh, whatever, how do you say it, but they won't stamp your passport, they know enough. And so I was there, and uh, just four, four, four and a half years ago, and I got a bike and I start going through the countryside and then I see the fruit stand and here's the proprietors and I would ask to talk to them in Spanish and hola, como esta? Oh, buen fruta. And I don't know how to speak, but I just do the best I can. And I find, oh, privado or, or uh, colectivo? Oh, privado, this is our own. Oh, who owns your land? We own. I was always told by my dad that they were all forced off the land, collectivized and everyone's miserable and they all want to swim to America. I didn't hear one person there who wanted to swim to America. <laughs> Sorry. They all know what they have. I see the rice growing, and I grow my own food at home. So I've harvested my own winter rye, my own oats, my own... I, I do this stuff every year, and I fill the root cellar. So I go out to talk to these guys. I see them in the field. I jump off the bike. First, they got to get out the bottle of rum, and they pour me a glass, and we're sitting here talking agriculture. And then I finally got to talk, light, and then I want to hear, Colectivo Privado. Oh, we're collective. He says, oh, we, do you like that? Uh, we love it, because we, we know each other our whole life. We're friends, we love working together. Those guys who have the private thing, they're working by themselves all day long. But the data shows they have more private than they have collective. That's just the data of Cuba. And um, when you see the signs, Viva <laughs> Fidel and Real, you have to go and talk to the people behind the sign, and so I did. And here, she's like, she can become a medical doctor. They export around the world there, a musician, a poet. And you read Castro's book and he's just like, arts, culture, sustainability, agro agronomy, growing food, they're completely organic food, the whole nation, because they can't afford chemicals, so now they became permaculture specialists. Here's their growing rice, drying it. These are all sacks of rice. I say, por bende o por family, familia. This is for their family. Talk about food security. What country has food security like this? They're sitting on it. They have beans, frijoles, they have rice. This guy still got his commie hat on. And he was ribbing me like all get out. It was really fun. And he still got the sign up. And these girls are going to, they, they have a lower infant mortality than America. They're going to have free education. They have dental care when they need it. Unbelievable. I mean, I've paid for every filling in my mouth. I have no insurance. I haven't until last year. Obamacare is the first year I've had health insurance. I've been two years at Dartmouth. But I saw this guy on the wrong boss in Spain. And I'm like, Che is still with us. <laughs> they didn't get him. CIA didn't get him. And I'm in Cuba watching this. And I grow my own food. So 
you know, I've been in California where you see Mexican farm workers living in 52 a shack with plywood piece and one bathroom for all 50. Six, seven days a week. I know what agribusiness is. I, I lived right in the belly of it in California for 12 years in San Luis Obispo. This is not what you see in Cuba. It's a very, look at this, three sisters, beans, nitrogen fixer, growing with the high feeder corn and squash, growing together. The jungle's still there. This boy, he's riding on a horse and I'm on my bike and he's just smiling and so I decided to get off the bike and go up the field. There's his dad pulling the monachini out, the tapioca root. And I look over, there's his granddad, three generations. And so I start all the nice questions. Whose land is this? Ours? Where'd you grow up? Here, this land. How about your grandfather? Oh, here, this is our family land. The lies I've been taught in my uh, propaganda machine as an American who were just like um, debunked over and over. So here's Jim at home, four year, years ago, um, deciding to move to Maine to be close to my mom, who, is, who passed away just recently, but I was hoping to be close to her to help her in her last years. And um, so we're building a house, me and my son there, milling the wood. I start, I'm very stubborn, so I start with a sawmill. And mill the wood, do the learn timber framing, mortise and tenon joinery, here's the root cellar. Super insulated foundation. And this is more or less a passive house that I'm building with help with some friends. Here's a double studded wall, a foot thick wall, filled with dense pack newspapers, recycle um, the shingles from a local shingle, local cedar. There's me putting linseed oil on it. And here's the inside uh, polished concrete that we did with Walden and Susan. I'm finishing the trim. All this trim work I did with the mill and a planer I bought off of Craigslist. And, all the finished wood was also built uh, from the land. And uh, three years later, we're in, and we spent our first winter, and it's a very toasty, warm, super insulated, passive house, off the grid completely, hot water solar on the roof, foil takes on the roof right now covered in snow, but that'll that soon sheds, or I climb up and dust it off. But we get 100% of our power um, from the sun. So I just want to share, well, how's our time here? Where is it now? Yeah. How much time do we have left? About 10 minutes. Okay. I'll try to be quick so I want some questions. Um, so 12 ways to practice degrowth. One is plant yourself near family, employment, services, in a place that inspires you. One child or less, later in life, or adopt. Alternative transportation and ride sharing. Just sharing the car. You put two in the car, you have your impact. But four in the car, it's one quarter of the impact. Double the miles per gallon, you're down to one eighth, one sixteenth. Half your travel, you're doing 130 second. You can still use a car and hardly use it. And you're low footprint with a car. Fall in love with cycling. Use it as your exercise. Live in a small, well insulated, healthy building or share space. You know, get more people into your house if you don't want to build a new house. Here's passive house uh, for $600 being offered in New York. This is me in Mexico looking at measuring a community's recycling and reduce, reuse, refuse, rethink, rebuild, rebel, recycle. Uh, seven is shoot your television. <laughs> Find alternative media and think for yourself. Think for yourself. Boycott. Support local. You know, organic. And this is just not just food, but if you were to find in Pennsylvania local product, you'd probably find like 80% of what you need daily from within a 40, 50 mile radius. Meditate, slow down, enjoy, breathe, relax, being in the present moment. And take an equalizer. Imagine having no food, home, friends, freedom. Imagine hearing bombs and you're trying to hold your little five-year-old boy and protect him from bombs blowing up all around you. And then, finally, I think if we fall in love with nature, that's like the key. Like how many people here have ever fallen in love? Anyone? Let me look. Okay, in the back, everyone, I think, more or less. Now, do you remember like the first week or two when you first fell in love? Anyone remember the times? Was it pretty magical? And did you ever do things you never thought you'd ever do? Yeah. And did it ever feel like a sacrifice when you are changing, you know? Because you're in love. When you're in love, you, you just will do anything. Um, and when we fall in love with the earth the way we fall in love with each other, we'll do what it takes. We'll figure this all out. So thank you very much for listening. So we do have time for questions. and. Uh, Okay, see a hand up in the back.
back there. Is there in the middle in the back section? Any suggestions on how we go about switching from agribusiness to more sustainable agriculture? Right. Well, in Maine, it's quite a movement where I live. Um, we have this organization called the Maine Farmers and Gardeners Association, and they started in the 60s, a bunch of alternative back-to-the-lander hippies, and they built an organization that's a powerhouse for lobbying and for education and outreach, but I think it starts from local. You know, I believe that everywhere I've lived, once I start looking, like once you know how to look, you'll find the organic farmers, they're everywhere. And you, if you build a, loop, a root cellar at your home, like dig a hole in the earth, like in your backyard. If you don't have a backyard, there's other ways to even keep your food, but I found farmers who would sell me all the winter produce, like, so I could eat almost year round in Maine without having to buy from California organic. So you can do it. And for example, I sprout mums, uh, green lentil, French cut lentil, uh, so sunflower seeds, alfalfa seeds. So I have like six or seven sprouts. So every all winter I have them growing in a jar, jars. I keep refreshing them every few days and making new ones. And then, uh, Cabbages in the root cellar, red and green, carrots, beets. So I can have a salad every single night of the year, even through winter, you know, just by having a root cellar. So maybe you in an urban area wouldn't have a root cellar, but still there's a way to really work on supporting local farmers. And they, there's a movement called uh, Community Supported Agriculture. And I can really say that's a good way to go too, is if you can't grow the food, find a farmer and contract with them, and you basically pay up front, and then they you take away their risk. They have the money to plant, buy the seeds, grow the food, and you get a box of food every week. And I know that those are happening all around the country. Could I ask, how do you feed the 20 million people in city environments where 50% of our population will be in 2040? Right, Cuba did it. And what they did was 30,000 organic farms with within the city limits of Havana. In the countryside, they're over 90% food self-reliant, and in the city, 60% food self-reliant. And they did it through researching permaculture and organic growing techniques. They call it agroponico there. And they basically, they were forced to do it, but now they do it out of pride. And they have so, like everyone there knows how to grow a bit of food. So you both know enough to grow like patio gardens, and then you also, support the infrastructure at, at the outlying edge of your city is defend that land for growing but you can also grow a ton of food on rooftops also so it's not un, un, unthinkable to really feed large portions of, the, of a densely urbanized population from this, the countryside but when you're grazing cows to feed uh, to grow feedstock for beef it's the most inefficient thing you could do so you have to transition from the inefficient to the efficient. And so when you go down on the food chain, like from a cow to a vegetable is a 30 factor. Basically you could, with 1 30th the land, you can get enough calorie. When you visit India, you see a billion vegetables.